Good morning and welcome to Matins on this Wednesday of the week after Christ the King. Thank you for being with me this morning. The scriptures we're using today, uh, our psalm is number 15. Uh, and again, we're going to move to another of the minor prophets. Today we'll be in Obadiah, which is the shortest book of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And we will continue our journey through First Peter. So today we'll begin chapter 2. Before we get into the word, let's have a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Bless us, O God, with a reverent sense of your presence, that we may be at peace and may worship you with all our mind and spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. Our psalm is number 15. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle? Who may abide upon your holy hill? Whoever leads a blameless life and does what is right, who speaks the truth from his heart. There is no guile upon his tongue. He does no evil to his friend. He does not heap contempt upon his neighbor. In his sight, the wicked is rejected, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He has sworn to do no wrong and does not take back his word. He does not give his money in hope of gain, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things shall never be overthrown. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you first chose to live among us, and in returning to your Father, you made an eternal home for us. Help us walk blamelessly in your ways, and bring us at last to your holy mountain, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ah, okay. So our first reading, Obadiah. It is only one chapter. So we will read verses 15 through 21. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow, and shall be as though they had never been. But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy, and the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau stubble, and they shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor for the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Those of the Negeb shall possess Mount Esau, and those of the Shephelah shall possess the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria, 
and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of this host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad shall possess the cities of the Negev. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. So, and I did not mark Obadiah. Mm. All right. All right. I didn't want you to have to wait for me. <laughs> It's such a short book, and the pages are so thin. Um, so if you're looking for it, it's Daniel, and then uh, Hosea, and Joel, and then Amos, and then Obadiah. So that's after the major prophets, right after Daniel. Then get, you get into the minor prophets, and you'll find Obadiah's right in there. So uh, Obadiah, it is only one chapter. Um, and we read the second half, so 15 to 21. The day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. Now, it's not surprising that we read that all through the New Testament, right? Um, Paul believed, as did some of the other apostles, that Jesus' return would be during their lifetimes. Not necessarily far-fetched for them to think that. Here we are 2,000 years later, still hasn't happened. Um, but now we're in the Old Testament. The day of the Lord is near. This was written somewhere 587 to 555 BC. So some six centuries before any of the New Testament was written. <laughs> so... And they thought the day of the Lord was coming then, right? Now, this, of course, refers to um, the Lord coming back. Um, so let's go back to this to the reading. Let me pull that back up. If you go back a little further and you say, you see this, on the day that you stood aloof, right? You being the Edomites, right? Um, this day that he's talking about is probably when the Babylonians captured Jerusalem in 587 BC. That's probably when he wrote this. So the day of the Lord will be, because the Babylonians took much of the people of Israel into captivity, remember? So... <clears throat> The day of the Lord is near upon all the nations, everyone. As you have done, so shall it be done to you. Right? Your deeds shall return on your own head. Now, this prophet is addressing it specifically to one people. Um, the Lord's great day of judgment would finally dawn for all nations. And you can look in Zephaniah chapter 1 for more about that. The hurt that Edom inflicted would now be inflicted on Edom by the justice of an eye for an eye, Leviticus 24, Deuteronomy 19. And this reversal theme runs through all of Obadiah. Yes, the people of Israel needed to feel God's wrath. And we, we talked a couple of weeks ago about how when God used other agents outside of the people of Israel, to inflict his wrath on the people who had turned against him. The agencies he used, the Babylonians, the Syrians, uh, the Assyrians, typically they would go farther than God needed them to. They enjoyed their victory over Israel too much. They enjoyed their power over Israel too much. They inflicted more pain than God wanted. So this is God's warning to them. As you have done, so it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return to your own head. 
if you were wicked to my people beyond what I needed you to do, you will receive wickedness in return. God's justice is very balanced. As you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow and shall be as though they had never been. So what's he talking about here? Jerusalem invaders drank a cup of triumph as they gloated over their victory. Right? So cups in this culture, like Jesus talks about his cup of suffering, you know, Lord, take this cup from me, but if it is your, let your will be done, not my own, right? This is the cup of triumph. They drank the cup of triumph over Israel. God would soon serve them his cup of wrath. And God's wrath will destroy nations so completely that they will no longer even exist. A nation to lose its place as history is much worse than just a military defeat. To be completely forgotten as though they had never been. That's a far worse fate than just being defeated on the field of battle. To be erased from history is a, a, a king and a people would shudder at that thought. But in Mount Zion, there shall be those who escape. All right, so we're starting to see some hope here. Look, there's a reference to Amos, Joel. There shall be those who escape. In contrast to the devastation that Edom and the nations will face, God provides a place of refuge for his people. Even when God lets his people feel his wrath, there is always an opportunity for redemption. He always saves a remnant of those people. He always sets some aside, right? There shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy. It shall be holy. It shall be, uh, yeah, God's judgment against Edom and other nations will cleanse the land, and his presence with his people will then make it holy. In the largest sense, Obadiah looked forward to God purifying and restoring all things at the end of history. Here we go again, looking forward. It's not just the immediate redemption of the people who had been conquered by Babylon, but the total redemption of God's people at the end of history, at the end of time, when it will all be made right. These prophecies describe God's saving intentions rather than setting a timetable table for events to happen. So another way of saying that is it's more about what's going to happen, not so much when it will happen. <clears throat> Israel will once again enjoy the covenantal blessings God had promised as the inheritance to Jacob. Right? The house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. Okay. <clears throat> Remember, when God talks about inheritance and promise possessions in the old testament it's usually about land right each of the tribes got us a portion of the of the promised land and each of the tribes divided up among the clans and the clans divided up among the families right the house of jacob right um yeah so jacob and esau the children of the promise, but Esau did not get the promise. Jacob did. Remember, he cheated his brother out of it. And he um, said, so Jacob shall be a fire, right? Um, so here is more of this language of reversal, right? This, which is how Ob our, this is Obadiah speaks like this, right? Um, God will use his faithful people descended from Jacob to consume the descendants of Esau, right? Jacob, specifically his son Joseph, the house of Esau will be stubble. Jacob will again triumph over Esau. They shall burn them and consume them. There shall be no survivor for the house of Esau. All right. <clears throat> so, um, Although Obadiah's message must have seemed unlikely at the time, the closing statement puts God's stamp of certainty on it. The Lord has spoken. This is what's going to happen. <clears throat> Esau and his, and his descendants did not get any of promise. And look there. Esau's descendants become the Edomites, those who have inflicted this pain on 
on God's people. Right? Interesting, isn't it? All right. Those are the Negeb, uh, the dry desert region in the southern portion of Israel. Um, all right. We get the verb possess six times, emphasizing the reversal of fortune for God's people who will again possess territory they had lost. Um, the Negeb, those of the Negeb shall possess Mount Esau. Shephelah. Okay. So the Philistines were another one of uh, Israel's longtime uh, enemies, right? Uh, so those are the Shephelah. Um, yeah, the foothills important to agriculture and forestry. The one in Judah was often disputed with the Philistines. So Philistines will lose it. These will get it. I'll possess the land of Ephraim, the land of Samaria. This is just north of Jerusalem. Benjamin, another one of the tribes, shall possess Gilead, uh, east of the Jordan River, occupied by Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. Right? Benjamin will get that. Um, so you get all kinds of who will possess, again, the territory they had lost. Uh, the exiles, in verse 20 of this host, these are the faithful remnant of God's people who returned from the Babylonian captivity. Um, you get more, they're going to They'll possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, a city on the coast northwest of the, uh, of the Sea of Chinnereth. Exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad. Yeah, city to which the Jews of Jerusalem were deported. They'll possess the cities of the Negev. There we go. We're back to the Negev again. Saviors. Saviors. Wow. Second Kings, Isaiah 19, Timothy 4. Saviors, God will give his people security from their enemies by providing them with good rulers. Greater fulfillment is in the new covenant when ministers of the, of the word give believers security against spiritual foes. Huh. Yeah, saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. There is the most important part. In the end, God will rule all. Just that was the theme of Christ the King Sunday. His people will serve and worship him in perfect peace. Eternity will be never ending worship and praise of the God who created, redeemed, and sustains us. All right. Tomorrow we'll be in Zephaniah. All right. Let's go back to 1 Peter. And we're going to read chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Okay. So, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. So, I love this particular opening verse here in chapter 2. Remember these chapters. Peter didn't write this with chapters. This is something 
scholars have inserted into the New Testament o- over time. Um, it just helps us to refer, hey, you know that part in Peter's letter where he says, <laughs> you said, say, chapter 2, verse 1. It's easier for us to figure that out. So um, put away all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. If we just stop there and just incorporated that into our daily lives, if everybody would would do that, how much better would the world be, right? Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Wow. Put it away. How do we do that? By contrition, daily. Contrition, recognizing that we do it and repenting of it. The Christian lives in a constant state of grace, so we can do that. Recognizing the grace given to us helps us with our contrition and our repentance. And like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it, spiritual milk, you may grow up into salvation. So just as an infant's crave its mother's milk, Christians crave God's nourishing word. That's that's what Peter's referring to here, talking about the word, the gospel. Remember the word, the good news that was preached to you, how we finished yesterday? By this word, you may grow up into salvation, right? Not earning it, but growing into it. That's called being made holy. Oh, wait, where have I heard that before? Called to be holy. Yeah. Right? See the theme here? So. You're as a baby, long for this for the word, the spiritual milk. You may grow into the with this milk, you may grow into salvation. The, the word constantly hearing it, letting it work on you, may help you become more holy. If you indeed have tasted that the Lord is good. All right, what's he talking about there? Taste and see that the Lord is good, right? Have you tasted that? Infants are satisfied by their mother's milk. Christians likewise find that God's word satisfies their deepest need. Have you heard the word? Do you know that the Lord is good? As you come to him, as you do that, who's him? Christ, right? A living stone rejected by men. Living stone. Why does he call him a living stone? So many metaphors here. The people of God are the temple in which he dwells, and Christ then is the cornerstone. And we'll see that in 6 and 7. This is where he's setting up this reference here, which is uh, Isaiah 28, Romans 9 and 10, right? So, the cornerstone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, well, that's no question that Christ is at. He was definitely rejected by men, definitely chosen and viewed as precious by God. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. God is building a temple out of his people. And the cornerstone is the found is part of the foundation that helps keep the whole structure. Um from the very beginning, to be the way it should be. The Father chose his own dear Son to be our Savior. It's God's eternal plan, like we discussed. Well, as we've been discussing him all week, I think we discussed it yesterday um, in Nahum, right? That this was God's plan from the beginning. Building us as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, not just those of us who wear this, all of God's people to be a holy priesthood, the priesthood of all believers to offer spiritual sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices, not killing an animal anymore, but um, something offered up to God as an act of worship or devotion or penance, right? Um, So priests offer sacrifices as we are now all a holy priesthood, All of us now, through Christ, have direct access to God. You don't have to go through a priest anymore. Christians offer the sacrifices of prayer and praise and thanksgiving, like we did last night, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Right? Nothing died. There was no bloodshed, but it was a sacrifice. 
all of these, prayer, praise, and thanksgiving, are acceptable to God because of the greatest sacrifice, Jesus Christ. His was the last blood that needed to be shed. Um, all of these are acceptable to God through Christ. It stands in Scripture, right? Here we go again. Isaiah 28. I'm laying in Zion, right? This is Jerusalem. This is where um, Judgment Day will take place. Laying a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Paul is repeating Isaiah's words here. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame, right? Romans 9 and 10. So the honor is for you who believe. For those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, right? They may have rejected it, but God is using it. They may have rejected Christ, but God is using him. Isaiah 28 prophesies that through that though Jerusalem would be destroyed, God would build a new Jerusalem that could not be destroyed. This is fulfilled in the creation of the church. Right? You are being you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. The people are the church, not the building. Okay. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Um, Isaiah 8, 14 explains that though Christ was to be a sanctuary for Judah and Israel, those who rejected him would fall in unbelief and be crushed. And unless they come to re they repent and come to faith, sin will end up destroying them as it did Judas. <laughs> they stumble and they stumble because they disobey as they were destined to do. So, but you, Israel, you, church, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, right? This is, remember, God's people were led by priests and kings. And now in Christ, that those roles are, are united, okay? A holy nation, right? The whole nation is to be holy. Right, we read about that also in the Minor Prophets that God's presence with His people when they come back into the land that they lost, the land would again be made holy, as He is present with His people. Also, the people and the land would be redeemed and made holy once more, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. That's worship right? That's worship. And as we are made a royal priesthood and a holy nation, and we recognize the one who did all, everything for us, we worship him and praise him. Once you were not a people, now you are. You're God's people. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, only in Jesus, the light of the world, can we truly see things the way they are. Um, darkness is sin and alienation from God, and the light of Christ takes us out of that darkness. Apart from God, humans are isolated, and they are not in relationship with him or with others as they could be. Having received God's blessings, he places us in his body, which is the church. Now we belong we are a part of God's people. That is what he has done for us. And we'll pick up there with verse 11 tomorrow. All right. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation 
by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, send forth your Son, we pray, that he may lead home his bride, the Church, that we with all the redeemed may enter into your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome in adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. And that concludes our matins for this Wednesday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me. And thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Um, <clears throat> I think we're still on track for tomorrow. Uh, so we should have matins again tomorrow and Friday. And then uh, suffrage is Saturday. So uh, again, thank you for being here. I appreciate your presence and your participation. And... I wish you a blessed rest of your Wednesday, and until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.